Coach, can you give us a timeline on your martial arts history? Age you started, what discipline for first, how long, etc. Between by the way, we need is a hobby Netflix special. <laughs> That's from Denzel. Denzel, thank you. Okay, guys, I started training at the age of 19. I was almost 20, so let's round it up to 20. I had I was just turning 20. I started in wrestling and jujitsu. My trainer was a sambo expert who learned BJJ from Henzo Gracie, Angelo Exaharacos. Listen to this, okay? Listen to what, this is interesting. Thank you for that question. I was learning from a purple belt from Hensel Gracie, who was also an expert in sambo, who was also a wrestler. The guy's whole life is grappling. He was also a gymnast, interestingly enough. He had a major influence on me, okay? Angelo Exeheracos would crush us all on the mats. That includes George. Like, we were just white belts, blue belts, but he would destroy us. Like, I'm telling you, like, it wasn't funny. Okay, we were tough kids, but we were nothing compared to him. He would mop the floor with the entire the entire gym. He would mop the floor with the entire gym. He would take us down, leg lock us. Yes, he was a leg locker back before it was cool. Okay, he was doing leg locks. I, I was expo I grew up with double legs, single legs. So to me, when I go to a gym and they don't have that, I find that's absurd. Like how many guys I could I, like would have whipped me if I didn't know these things. And I asked myself, why aren't they training it? Well, I realized that their trainer took it out of the system once upon a time. Somebody out there in the lineage got lazy. He's like, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm not going to do the hard part. Let's do the part on the ground. Big error. My trainer had four hernia disc discs in his neck. Think about that. Now, when I tell you my Genesis story, you're going to realize why I'm the way I am. You're going to realize it. This is my martial arts childhood here. Why am I so obsessed with safety? Well, my great trainer was told that if he continues training, he's going to be paralyzed. Now, His problem is very likely genetic, okay? Because he also has that in his family. It's hereditary. However, grappling and wrestling accelerated it. At his neck, no go. If he continues grappling, he'd be paralyzed. One wrong move, one bad spill, he's paralyzed from the, from the, from the neck down. Imagine that. So he retired. He stayed relevant by coaching and teaching, etc. But eventually, you know, he's, he's very successful in business. Like everything, the guy's successful in everything. Raising a family, great human being. He was a purple belt under Henzo's when he retired. I later gave him his brown belt. As his student, I became a black belt. I gave him his brown belt, which was a great time, a great moment in my life. And, uh, you know, he was keeping up with technique, but later on he, he got too busy. Life got too busy, family, uh, business, etc. So now he's not drilling anymore. But one day I hope to give him his black belt. And my trainer, give my own trainer his black belt, which would be a dream. He was such a great human being, so positive, so fantastic, so physically fit, guys. He teaches us like how he gets fit, pull-ups, dips. Like He taught us the right way from the beginning. That's why I, one reason why I was so successful as a trainer later on. I, so, I had such a great role model. Like Not doing takedowns was absurd to him. Like, that makes no sense. First of all, he learned to wrestle before he learned jiu-jitsu. He learned wrestling, then sambo, then jiu-jitsu. Okay? When jiu-jitsu exploded on the scene, UFC 1, UFC 2, he would drive up every single weekend to the Hensel Gracie Academy. Look how dedicated of a human being he is. He would drive up every single weekend. So Friday's done, 5 o'clock, boom, punch out. He'd drive down to New York, train Saturday, Sunday, drive back home. And then he would teach class in Montreal two to three times a week. What a dedicated human being. Look at the, the seeds he planted. I ended up training with him. Then I trained George, etc. And it just, he planted those seeds. You know, there are many other great trainers at TriStar Gym. Conrad Plux, uh, also, he was world champion kickboxing. He's the founder of the gym. Um, uh, Michel Lavalle, uh, another gentleman I never got to meet. He's the third founder. Um, his name was Ron, I believe. Ron, I, I believe he's passed away. So I'm not sure much about his story. A lot of these guys, we learned training the right way. Like, we were... Learning jiu-jitsu in a kickboxing gym also. So we were always crossing paths with kickboxers. Actually, my trainer, he had a club. He just rented a room from a kung fu place. And then he moved us to TriStar. He's like, it's better. There's going to be kickboxers there. Like, he was such a wise trainer. And he really, he really uh, influenced my style and understanding of martial arts. Now, I'll tell you another very interesting thing. Back then, there were no grappling tournaments. There, there was, but there were nothing to write home about. Like, we would go and we would just mop the floor with everybody. We'd win. If we, if if my trainer, Angelo Exaracos, brought five guys, all five guys would medal because everybody else was just doing, like, 
head squeezing. We were the only guys who really had jujitsu. Okay. Then there was a few other guys that were okay, but they were not our level. And it was just like, we had a major advantage. Okay. So I, it wasn't like big tournaments. It was tournaments in a gym. It wasn't like there was no money involved. Maybe they'd give us like 150 bucks or something. There, there wasn't that many. There, it was just, it was just a new boom of jujitsu. It was exciting. For us, it was a big deal. We were young kids. You know, we've been training six months and we're gold medal. We're first on the podium. But our, my trainer was also prepping us more for MMA. Like he would make us spar standing. It, it, there was no like, the goal wasn't jujitsu tournaments. The goal was MMA fights. Jujitsu tournaments were things we did on the side just for like, for fun. You know, we'd go to a local gym. They'd divvy up the the brackets and we'd wrestle each other. It wasn't on TV. It was just like a local thing. And I did a lot of those. But the goal was MMA. That was just that was just practice for MMA. You know, it was fun to win. Of course, we wanted to be number one, but MMA was always the end goal. Now you got a generation of kids that are just doing it for, let's say, an IBJJF tournament. So their style is very different than ours. We would train grappling, wrestling, then we would hit the bag. And everybody in jiu-jitsu would have to stand up. So we'd have sparring standing up. It's funny, I was just telling my students, you know, like the ones who compete in jiu-jitsu, because I got a team of guys who just compete in jiu-jitsu. And, you know, two weeks ago, we won best team. You know, the most goal, the most first places and all that. And I was really happy. But I was telling that team, even though you guys are just doing jiu-jitsu, even though you got, you should once a week or once every two weeks do like uh, pancreas, open palm sparring. like Just like, you know, no gloves. You don't even need gloves. You're kicking, you're punching, you're shooting your partner down. You're taking your partner down. And I was telling them, guys, it's harder than jiu-jitsu. It's going to make you better athletes. It's more calories per second. It's more intense. So when you go to a grappling tournament, you're going to feel like, hey, this is uh, it's not so bad, you know. And a lot of them were kind of joking around like, hey, we don't want to. No, no, it's they don't want to mix it up with the, with the MMA guys. And I understand that, but they can do it amongst themselves or the MMA guys, you know, they're friendly. They won't butcher them, of course. You know, they'll give them a, a good workout. But it always was like that in the past. And I, that's why I loved watching um, the... Rotulo brothers when they were prepping for who's number one this is like I don't know a couple months ago I was watching their matchup and they showed like how they prepped and Andre Galval was making them wear MMA gloves this is before their grappling session and they were sparring takedowns and they were doing a little bit of MMA before their grappling session for who's number one which is a grappling tournament there's no striking in who's number one the event is called who's number one and I thought that's so brilliant that's so brilliant that's how we used to do it back in the day now Andre Galval is formerly the Abu Dhabi world champion but he's an MMA fighter. He used to be an MMA fighter. He understands the importance of being able to defend yourself, throwing a punch. MMA is more intense. It's going to complement your jiu-jitsu. It's not going to take away from it. There's a certain amount of MMA that will help your jiu-jitsu. Okay? Now, I'm not saying do MMA to win in jiu-jitsu. No, if you take the world's best MMA guy and you put him in a Abu Dhabi, he's going to get crushed. What I'm saying is think about the Pareto principle. You want to do 80% of jiu-jitsu and 20% something else that's going to complement your jiu-jitsu that's why I think conditioning is really important or MMA sparring it's going to spice up your jiu-jitsu it's going to make you break the habits whatever habits you're doing you're going to reinvent yourself you're going to find you're going to you're going to get the fight to the ground but your heart rate is going to be elevated why you have to time a takedown you have to strike now that your heart rate is elevated you have to pass the guard now it's a different you're, you're passing the guard but you're in a different different element here you're in a different state of being okay so then when you go back to passing the guard where your heart rate is not elevated it feels easy okay so we're just pushing the envelope a little bit 